Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar, Mastering the Data That Matters, sponsored by YP and presented together with Rocket Fuel and the Mobile Marketing Association. Thanks for joining us. My name is Joe Gagan. I'm the Content Studio Coordinator here at Digiday, and I will be your host for today. In just a few moments, we will be joined by three panelists, including our moderator, Leo Skolin, who is the VP of Industry Programs at the Mobile Marketing Association. Leo is responsible for developing strategically grounded initiatives that both drive the growth of the mobile marketing spend and reduce friction within the mobile marketing industry. His vast experience and entrepreneurial spirit lends itself to helping shape the direction of a burgeoning industry and the companies within it. Also joining us is Doug Miller, VP of Analytics at Rocket Fuel. Doug oversees efforts to optimize the use of Rocket Fuel's technology and solutions to attain customer and campaign success. With over 15 years of driving results across digital and enterprise analytics, he enjoys finding integrated technology solutions for customers' marketing challenges. And last but certainly not least, we will be joined by Derek Zabia, VP of National Markets at YP Solutions. Derek is a seasoned digital business executive with a proven track record of excellence in strategic business development, driving revenue growth, and building high-performance teams. Prior to joining YP Marketing Solutions in 2014, Derek was EVP of Strategic Development at Audax Health, and VP and Director of Sales and Business Development at Ning, where his responsibilities included marketplace evaluation, value creation, business development, and sales. Together, they'll walk us through the vast array of audience-based data available to the modern marketer, as well as the challenges and opportunities that arise when customizing and personalizing your advertising efforts to every potential customer. A question and answer period will follow our presentation, so please stay through to the end. Feel free to submit questions at any time via our chat interface. At some point tomorrow, you will receive an email with a link to the recorded webinar, so keep an eye on your inboxes for that. And without further ado, let's get started. Leo, Doug, Derek, take it away. Thanks very much, Joe. As Joe mentioned, I'm, I work with the Mobile Marketing Association. I've been there now five years. And um, we'll start. I've only got a few slides, but I want to set this up because we are in the era of data. Um, some can say we're in the era of big data. One could say we're also in the era of first-party data third-party data, there's a lot of challenges and a lot of opportunities presented to our industry, the mobile marketing industry, with this um, influx of data. Um, we won't talk about all the challenges today, but we will probably talk about some of the opportunities. Um, but I wanted to use this first slide to talk about uh, the advertising ecosystem. It was a few years ago when uh, the mobile DSPs really kind of came into existence and uh, really started to shine. Um, and they revealed to me something that I think you'll learn more about today, which is that they have an enormous uh, access to data, um, data so much, so much access and so many data points that they can actually come into a, a, a buy, into a campaign negotiation with far more insight into the customers and into the, um, the, the, uh, the prospects than almost anybody on the planet, including the publishers they're doing business with. But this is starting to change, and I think you'll hear more about that today. But advertisers come with their own first-party data. We'll talk a little bit about that more in a minute. Um, uh, they rely on DMPs as well to, uh, to fortify their data. Publishers have their own first-party data. So, um, and DMPs represent um, a, a unique um, uh, add-on that um, is, is a very important piece of the equation. But DSPs bring all this together and feed it into their algorithms to help divine the right campaign and the right optimization techniques. Um, and optimization is really the name of the game these days. When I started in advertising many, many decades ago, and I'm, you can tell from my gray hair that I've been around a while, um, we used to we, we, we talked about media planning as a you know you kind of plan it and forget it um, and because you you plan it and you bought it and then you you basically waited for the next plan to start. Well now. Um, Clients and their agencies devote, you know, an enormous amount of their budget to social search, and then they take the remaining portion of that budget and start to spread it around and figure out where it's working best. And that the DSP helps in that regard, uh, the trading desk helps in that regard, but it really requires constant optimization. So when you're doing a media plan, it's not like you planned it and forgot it; you're planning it and doing it all the time. So that's a that's a pretty tricky deal here. And one that you know uh, puts an enormous amount of weight and importance on data. If you advance the slide, I'll talk a little bit about the kinds of data that are feeding into the system from the various providers. Um, the publisher, of course, has user self-provided data. Uh, this is actually very good data in, in many accounts. Sometimes it's um, it's overvalued, um, but it's, it's and I don't mean that 
a negative way to publishers, but when you're talking about location data, some uh, user self-provided data may not lend itself to accurate uh, targeting, but it does lend itself to accurate identification of who the people are. The publisher also might have certain keyword and category data, they have some location data. Um, we're working individually here at, at the NMA to try and encourage publishers to um, uh, put more um, accurate data parameters, uh, particularly in the open RTB spec, so that um, we are not, and this is a, this is up to now has been a, an optional field, but we're now looking to try and make it more of a recommended field, so that when publishers are putting location data in their um, the ad call, that it's actually got some relevance and some currency. Um, and then, of course, there's publisher data on, on content engagement, and that's an exciting area uh, to help explain the context that the user's in. The advertiser, of course, is coming with an enormous amount of customer information, which has um, purchase history and the advertising engagement and um, has lifetime value and, and other things that are increasingly important to them. And advertisers are increasingly looking for better attribution because, as we all know, mobile has become uh, profoundly complex because of so many channels. Um, but in the meantime, um, we, um, uh, you know, we, we are, are, are seeing a, a great opportunity to um, use advertiser data in new and better ways. DMTs, on the other hand, uh, this is categorized data by segments for use in campaigns and different verticals of finance retail. Very, very important stuff. So um, the, um, the bottom line, if we go to the next slide, is that, you know, first party, second party data, there's, you know, a lot of reasons why you, you, you use second, first, second, and third party data. Um, customer insights is the number one reason. Uh, the second reason it's easy to justify because, you know, because it's a financial ROI. Um, it demonstrates the highest increase in customer value and, of course, the highest performance. So there's a lot of great reasons why data is important, and I think you're going to see some really clever and uh, incredible opportunities derived from data. Uh, as our rocket fuel and why people talk about today. So um, thanks for this brief introduction, and uh, we look all look forward to hearing from our partners now. Here's to hear it over to Doug. Um, thank you so much for that amazing introduction. Um, you did a great job. Um, if we can go on the next slide. Um, so the way that we view this, and it really ties into everything we just talked about and how you categorize data and how you activate data, but really, consumers are living moment to moment. Um, I don't know how many people currently on the call currently have multiple browser tabs open on their mobile device as well as on their laptop, as well as they're supposed to be listening to their spouses potentially when they're home. But there's all of this information flying at people, and people are transitioning quicker than ever before between different moments of their lives from researching to other things. Let's go to the next slide, please. Um, and that sort of leads to this epiphany that we've had while working with YP Marketing Solutions that one-to-one -one marketing isn't sufficient. The sort of promise of one-to-one -one marketing is that if you get the right message to the right person, magical things happen, right? Old-school database marketing. Who is the consumer? What is their propensity to buy this product? Let's send them that email, and then we're going to get, on average, 20% left. But if you think about how much more complex things are with consumers today, and also how much more relevant consumers expect things to be, you know, in this case, we have our generic Jane here, who is probably about to go into a meeting with her CFO or CEO, who is probably running some numbers on her tablet. If you serve her a message that's not actually relevant to that moment, it not only won't be ideal, it might actually have negative impact. If she's very interested in yoga, as the second picture here shows, showing her a Groupon deal about yoga isn't going to be appropriate versus in the other area, in the other moments throughout her day, it may be very, very relevant in order to serve her that ad or that message from the advertiser. Let's go to the next slide. And so the way that we think about it is we really want to stop marketing to segments and profiles. The segments and profiles are critically important but instead leverage that data along with a lot of real-time data to determine at an individual opportunity to interrupt someone in their day or in the stream of doing something, how do you serve them the right message? How do you leverage all that data in real time to actually serve the right message in the right moment? Next one. Um, and instead of sort of seeing what worked in the last campaign, last month, or this time last year, how do you actually understand how that real-time moment um, scoring and how we actually are taking advantage of those interactions 
how is that working not just last month and last week, but how has it been working today? What has been changing today in real time down to seconds and milliseconds into how people are changing how they're engaging? And then the last thing is, which is very relevant to the mobile solution, is, you know, if you look over the last year, people used to just shop, used to just browse on mobile devices, then went desktop to buy. More and more people are now buying on mobile devices. Instead of figuring out how much you want to put against devices or mobile devices, how much on desktop, how much in video, how much on Facebook, instead influence consumers in those moments on the devices and the context that they are choosing to consume content to maximize returns for the advertiser and for their campaigns as opposed to artificially putting sort of um, budgets and constraints on it and which leads to suboptimal results. Hopefully Janine's perfect. Um, so here's an example. We can go through this pretty quickly. But we have three campaigns. Two of them are leading to conversions. One of them we want an engagement or a click. And throughout the day, those three campaigns are getting different scores based off of the different things that we know that Jane is doing. And what that ends up leading to at the end of this build is different scores for these different advertisers for the same consumer based on what they're doing. And any sort of segment-based approach or sort of um, profile-based support wouldn't pick up these nuances and would lead to significantly worse results for the advertiser and would also lead to a worse consumer experience for the consumer because you're showing her messages that are not critical to the moment she's at in her day. And that gets to sort of this whole, what we've been talking about, marketing in the moment, where, you know, we think about demographics, which is who the person is, behavioral, what they've been doing, and contextual, what they're doing right now, or what they've been doing very recently that's very key to the campaign. And, um, you know, YPD.com specifically provides a huge amount of contextual and behavioral data of real consumers interacting in moments of influence. Now, the difference between the left-hand side here of segment marketing and marketing in the moment is in the marketing in the moment, we know their demographics, their behavioral, and their contextual, but we're not targeting those individually and setting budgets against them and measuring the performance of each of those in a vacuum. Um, the most common example you can think about is if you're dealing with um, an auto vendor or uh, an auto um, uh, brand, and they want to sell cars. It's very common for them to say, well, let's target contextual, let's target in market, and let's retarget people who have been on my website. But you get into these interesting intersections where there are people who are on your website 29 days ago and are technically in retargeting, but might have huge signal from a third-party data source about that they're in market for a luxury car. And if you have, and then they may convert and you may convert to contextual retargeting, but it may actually be the data behind that that was actually feeding the fact that they're in market that actually drove that conversion. And what that leads to is not only not optimal um, outcomes for the actual advertising campaign and the advertiser, it also leads to bad insights and bad decisions going forward, thinking the retargeting is what drove the success, so you put more budget against it, versus knowing they were also in market and it was a combination of those two. So again, this is just taking a look at, right, Jane, on one point, is in San Jose. She's on her tablet. It's Tuesday. She's at work. Not a good time to show her a Groupon for yoga. But on Saturday at night, as she just saw a concert ad and she's on her mobile device, might be exactly the right time to show her that yoga Groupon um, offer because she wants a new dress and she needs to fit in it. So let's go forward. So how does this actually work? So we have what we like to think of data, decisions, and then delivery. So the data, and in this case, what we find extremely valuable um, from my marketing solutions in, spe in specific, is we have a huge amount of data coming from them, which is very specific, very high fidelity about consumers looking for solutions. And we can draw a lot of correlations and causations from those needs to other things they're in market for. When we add that, plus the 90 billion advertising impressions we could serve every day, which is 10 times the number of Google searches there are globally, 
combining those two things in that data every day, 24-7, really gives us the data, which then powers the next level, which are the decisions, which are human plus artificial intelligence. So the human piece is, um, particularly with YP.com, where we get a lot of our data from for um, the YP marketing solutions, they have thousands of different categories and probably more than hundreds of thousands of different individual solution providers that people can search for and interact with on their properties. Making sense of that and putting that together so that artificial intelligence and models and computers can use that is very akin to zip codes. Um, any of you who are building predictive models should never use zip code as a feature in your model. What you should use is metadata about that zip code. What is the local and historic weather been? What is the forecast for it? What is the average income of the area? What is it urban? Um, are there major news events in that area that could influence consumer behaviors? Taking all that metadata and putting it into the model is extremely powerful, but it takes humans to create that in order so the models can make better decisions. Because if you just base it off of five random numbers, or let's say in this case a random URL string or a random provider ID, then you're not going to get the leverage and you're not going to get the business outcomes that you need. And then finally for delivery, it's about how do you deliver to the right device at the right time? How do you have access to the right inventory? And how do you score all those varying inventory across all of the available data, across all of the interactions with that consumer, regardless of which device they're on? And then it's ultimately also about making sure, sorry, that brands are not highlighted next to bad content, right? And that's why we want to make sure we have quality controls. Um, this right here is a highly technical thing that comes out of our interface. Um, but what that those green dots are and red dots and yellow dots are individual ads that were, that were served to um, consumers from an individual advertiser. And what that shows is that we are paying, because the um, y-axis there is actually how much we're paying for those ads, varies dramatically, and it's a logarithmic scale. And on the bottom, it's how valuable we believe those moments are that we're trying to serve those messages within. And what you can see is, while overall, the higher the value of the moment, the more that we're willing to pay because it's going to have more impact, there are also many opportunities to get high-value moments at extremely low cost across whether they're on their mobile, their desktop, or their tablet device. And being able to do that across those, you may have a moment that's half as valuable at a tenth of the price on a mobile device versus one on desktop that's twice as valuable, that's ten times more expensive. And being able to trade those things off is what really drives the key efficiencies here. Next, yeah, perfect. Um, so um, we've actually been brainstorming a while about YP.com's audience and how incredibly valuable it is. Um, we actually, I think, have 82.9 million unique customer profiles. We have over 65% of them householded across more than one device. Um, there we see 23 million interactions with YP.com on a weekly basis. And the specificity, the recency, and the reach of that data creates extremely high predictive power. Um, one of the biggest challenges is there's so much data and it's so specific that boiling it up into this category, people searching for plumbers, increase sales at a offline sales for a, um, a uh, sorry, I'm struggling here, um, for a home improvement store by 13%. It's not as simple as that. But what we wanted to show here on the left is the reach and the breadth of their data, and it's entirely across gender, age, income, geographics, looks like the E was cut off on states there, sorry, along with um, whether or not they have children and whether they own or rent, is really incredibly broad but then the specific power of that data, without it being third party, without it being modeled, without you not knowing where the data is coming from, really drives significant, significant results for YP Marketing Solutions advertisers. Perfect. So um, we've got a couple of case studies here. So um, in this first case study, there's a credit card company that wants to target premium business travelers. Right? And business travelers are hard to reach. They're hard to convert. You know, you can do some contextual targeting, but you never really know where they are because they're consumers. 
one key thing that we were able to find is people who are traveling a lot, who change their locations a lot, and are consistently searching for a services in a specific zip code or geo where they are not, became a very good predictor of how likely they were to sign up for this credit card company's offer. And so their goal for credit card signups was $500. YP Marketing Solutions working with us drove something at $396, which is a 20% savings, which means those customers are 20% more profitable. And high-level things, beginning of the week and daytime were very um, um, predictive. Whether they were interested in gifts, retail, and events, context was very interested. And then overall, high household income men in urban areas indexed very high for this. But it was really the power of unlocking those people searching for local services where they are in and then traveling during the week. That really helped us hone in on that highly profitable customer who would convert at a cost-effective price point. And we have another thing here, and this is really much more of a branding campaign to create awareness of a pest control company. And same thing here. There was a huge amount of data, and it was a very long tail, which is why we weren't able to represent it as cleanly as I would have liked, along the fact of there are ways to predict based off of YP.com data that's coming to us on people who very likely just purchased new homes. Also based off of weather information about where they're searching for services, despite where they're geographically located, can also be a very good predictor of how likely they were to engage with this brand. And then we saw that, you know, um, by removing a time of day constraint that was initially asked for by the advertiser, we were able to increase engagement rates with the ads because even though people may have been less likely to engage late at night or early in the morning, those consumers, when it was the right moment for them, were much more likely to engage with the brand and increase that awareness, despite the fact that on average those times of day were not um, good across all consumers, doesn't mean for specific consumers they were the exact right moments to score. And so again, it really all starts with powerful, true data signals. And um, third-party data can sometimes be very, very valuable, but what we invariably see is third-party data can be valuable for a while and then drop off. And what we've seen working with YP.com for quite a time is there are 80 million unique customer profiles, there are 23 million interactions, and really specific, uh, specificity, the recency and the reach, really creates powerful signals which drive success and business outcomes for their advertisers. Thank you, Doug. Um, hi, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Next slide, please. We're really pleased to uh, be a part of this discussion with Digiday and with Rocket Fuel <clears throat> and all the industry leaders that have been participating with us in redefining this new consumer journey. Um, as a leader in the marketplace and connecting national brands to local market audiences, uh, we have a deep passion and commitment around driving the thought leadership. And what we wanted to share with you here is a little bit about some of the research that we've recently completed with IDC with regard to understanding the local search intent, and unleashing that opportunity. Uh, mobile um, is clearly uh, been a dramatic impact in terms of consumer usage, and its impact within the local search marketplace has been incredibly powerful. We know the value of this with over 90% of commerce still happening at the retail brick and mortar point of purchase. Uh, is still incredibly valuable for all marketers, independent of your objective, whether it be a branding and awareness objective or a conversion. We know that the value here is incredibly impactful. And as the consumer path has changed, uh, we we you know commissioned this incredible research that's really started to kind of really illuminate that when you start talking about the impact of the shift from desktop to mobile and 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 candidly how that's translating into a 78% of all searches uh, resulting in a local purchase. You know, I think when when Doug was talking about the value of recency and the impact, this has been you know just further data that we've commissioned that's really shown what our advertisers are seeing is really, uh, frankly, happening at a macro level. Next slide, please. So, what's really driving that? 
as Doug kind of touched on when we were talking about data and delivery and solutions, this is really what we believe um, is how we've adapted to that new consumer journey. And frankly, all marketers are challenged with this in terms of how we balance what's the right moment, what's that right sort of connective tissue in terms of understanding the intent signals. And with YP, our intent signals are proprietary and first party. And so when we talk about the scale that we are seeing with regard to that 80 million plus um, monthly uniques with regard to our search intent signal combined with over 150 million uh, profiles from a, from a mobile perspective, understanding the recency of those activities and being able to combine those signals is incredibly powerful in being able to have us connect that data in a really clean, efficient way to really align with the, the the dramatic things that are happening with regard to attribution models and the values that are critical for you as a marketer and an advertiser. Understanding how we're navigating from search and then how that user's consumer journey is changing to two hours later at their son or daughter's basketball game to two hours later from there being on another device and that happening at a different point within the, within the consumer's consideration set. All of those things are incredibly powerful and understanding when that right moment is, is ultimately incredibly powerful for you and being able to convert at whatever that various KPI may be for you, whether that be the e-commerce transaction, whether that be actually driving them to the point of purchase. We understand that it's the value that's driven from the data that's ultimately the connective tissue to that attribution. And as we've started to navigate this journey, this is why we have really kind of honed in on understanding that data delivery equals the, the most effective solution. Next slide, please. So when we talk about that, we talk a lot about location, and certainly there are a lot of people within the location space. Uh, at YP, we've been really fortunate to, frankly, um, be an early pioneer in understanding the value of location data and being able to provide context around the location-based profiles uh, that we actually patented many years ago to understand that actually as you start to get more advanced in understanding consumer behaviors, you can really start to understand how you, you have to look at this within different cuts uh, to understand the context of the, the location data that you're receiving and ultimately how getting to that right moment can actually drive attribution, whether it be in a, in a transactional way via a device or a desktop, or more importantly, uh, and increasingly so, getting them actually physically confirmed on a one-to-one -one basis in the store. Um, many of the attribution models that we uh, have seen prior to the past year or so have really been more based on uh, samples. Uh, and frankly, some limited samples. And what we're doing at YP is we're actually bringing that attribution to a one-to-one -one level on campaigns that our marketers are seeing tremendous value in. When we talk about the value of local search intent, uh, this is incredibly powerful. And as Doug mentioned, we, we have had a, a significant uh, growth within this business over the past year. And we think it really ultimately comes back um, to understanding the value of our signals. This is actually um, kind of the cornerstone of that local search intent uh, signal that, that Doug was referencing. And I think it really speaks to the value of recency and understanding how that connects to the point of purchase. Really impactful here, the yp.com search intent signal is actually over-indexing in terms of general searchers and their intent to purchase at more than 20%. So 66% of YP.com uh, initiate, in, initiated searches versus 54% in terms of general market. So all the other collective search engines together. How often do they contact a merchant? How recent do they contact a merchant? Again, you're talking about almost a 20% over index versus other searches. So the power that we're seeing with regard to recency, with regard to our ability to capture the categorization and translate that into the right moment to connect that, that user with the right opportunity for that brand is really translated from the value of this real-time search intent signal. And as we talk about how we want to leverage that data and understand the context of those search signals, we really start with our search marketplace, uh, which is you know, a real-time 
uh, bitted and fully trans you know, transparent marketplace with regard to understanding how we actually are providing uh, not only advertising solutions but organic listings as well to sort of understand what is that signal, how can we then repurpose that signal to the right person at the right moment via our cross-device cross retargeting platform, and then also extending that where appropriate to various look-alike model and act-alike model audiences. And we think that that's critically important because as we take in all these various points of data, we have been able to uh, really develop uh, an audience cartography concept that we'll talk a little bit more about, but it's really about understanding what's the context of the behavior associated with the intent signal of search with the with the readily available information that we have on that user around location. So we can start to get into understanding and providing a deeper context to our marketing partners around what's the behavior within the certain actions and intent that they're providing us. And so I'll just go over a couple of brief case studies just to sort of demonstrate this. <clears throat> We had uh, one of our one of our partners from last year actually had commissioned uh, with us a campaign that was specifically looking for a very specific uh, camera lens uh, audience, and they wanted to kind of understand. You know, we're, we're, we obviously there are various places that we can go, but we understand that our consumers, when they actually have initiated a search, that the recency is incredibly important to us. We want to find those people very quickly. Uh, we want to enable. Uh, a retargeting strategy uh, via cross device and desktop to sort of understand how that we can effectively get to them very quickly. Um, this campaign, uh, which obviously dealt with a product that was uh, relatively a, a, a niche product, uh, was really effective in increasing their sales and exceeding their conversion metrics. But I think the, the, the other key aspect to take away here is that it's that breadth and that depth of the contextual search within a platform like YP and the uniqueness of the various searches that we get that allows us to understand you know, this isn't a, purchase, a, a consumer that's really sort of researching that specific lens or you know, can understanding sort of what might be the various points of value within that that you may get with a general search engine. This is a consumer that whenever they are you know, applying this search intent within a YP.com framework, they're looking and, and intending to go explore that device, to see that device, and ultimately purchase that device. And we were able to connect that uh, to get that message back in front of them from a moment perspective uh, at those precise moments to drive an effective KPI. And this is uh, just another case study that I think is obviously, you know, in very much a, a very different category, but frankly, one of my um, uh, one of my favorite case studies uh, from our mobile platform last year, which is, you know, this is uh, obviously dealing with a, a, a large national auto uh, dealer group uh, that was looking for us to specifically address a, a service marketplace that they were looking to, frankly, share shift in, um, and how are we able to sort of understand and find uh, unique users that not only specifically had uh, unique attributes with regard to kind of the car or services that they may be looking for, but also that we're most likely to be within uh, various parameters to drive a specific outcome. And then more effectively, how could you actually take that data that you have to drive effective sort of reach and frequency models so that we make sure that we're really effective? And then ultimately, how could you get to a point of helping us from an attribution standpoint, whether it be sort of uh, you know, fairly straightforward tactics with regard to couponing, but then also ultimately how can we sort of verify that those users have actually showed up at the point of purchase and engaged within the service. We were really uh, deeply embedded with this client and this agency on this campaign um, as, it was a, as, as a, it was a significant uh, initiative for them in 2015, and we really got very precise with regard to our dials and actually uh, drove one of their most effective campaigns for the entire year, ultimately resulting in a one-to-one -one, uh, attribution of a 15x lift in terms of those users that were touched at the right moment uh, to an actual outcome of that user being actually on the dealership to engage within a service. Um, really demonstrates the value of the mobile display as a component of taking a search intent signal 
or a location behavioral profile and being able to influence someone at the point of purchase. And so as we look to 2016, we understand and know that we've got an incredible asset with regard to all these components of delivery and the data that we are able to provide to marketers. And we know that we've got a really nice attribution model that we've sort of, uh, you know, really pioneered in 2014 and into 2015. And I think we've seen, started to see uh, even some other uh, folks within the marketplace start to uh, build similar sort of models. I think what we know is that from a one-to-one -one attribution standpoint, we know that that's critically important. We know that driving conversions is important. What we're really seeing and what we know that the market is asking from us and what we think where we're going as a partner uh, with our very best customers is really trying to understand how this data can actually be translated back into meaningful consumer insights for us. You know, the, the bar for us is continually being raised, so understanding from those various intent signals, what can you tell us about the other things that those consumers are engaged with from a search standpoint? What can you tell us about where else they go? How can you tell us um, how that correlates to various indices across various demographics? Or even how can we build specific unique customer profiles to really help us kind of understand how should we be applying the consumer insights that we're learning in real time from you across our other campaigns. And these are really impactful things that when it comes to the complex attribution models that many of our agency and client partners are faced with, we understand that the value from a click or a call or a foot traffic action is incredibly complex. And how can we as a partner uh, be providing those insights that are frankly differentiated and in real time? And that's where we see ultimately a lot of our value you know, moving forward, uh, really being demonstrated for our customers in 2016. And so as we think about, as we wrap up today and think about, you know, how does this translate for you? We've got an incredible partner um, uh, with Rocket Fuel and other folks that we work with within the marketplace to help us really kind of understand what's the right moment to connect, to uh, contextually connect brands to the right local market consumer, and it's it's demonstrating to be incredibly powerful for us. And so, we'd really uh, you know welcome your opportunity, welcome the opportunity to speak with you with regard to our mobile search and display opportunities to really you know drive a conversation in, in helping you drive true innovation and in connecting those brands to local market results. Uh, as, I, as I just conclude, we understand and, and really appreciate the value that, that many of us are all chasing with regard to our e-commerce and m-commerce objectives, but we absolutely understand the value of the local market audience uh, and the fact that we still have you know, more than 90% of commerce taking place within our local markets today, and we really think we can be part of that solution to help you achieve uh, greater outcomes and more efficient outcomes uh, at a scalable way. So thank you. Joe? Great. Thank you very much, Derek. That was excellent. Uh, and big thanks to, to Doug and Leo as well. Um, so we will now have the Q&A period. Uh, feel free to drop questions in the interface, uh, and we will um, your, your questions will, will eventually be seen by someone, and <laughs> hopefully uh, someone will reach out to you about that. So um, if we can just hop to the, I think there's, there's a, yeah, perfect. Awesome. Um, okay, so we've got a we've got a great question here that Derek, you, you spoke to this a little bit, and uh, Leo and, and Doug, you guys probably have uh, some insights on this as well. But uh, something that you know, as as an industry, we're all facing together uh, in the context of reducing ad fraud. How will DSPs and tech partners ensure transparency with their clients? What do you guys think? And how are you approaching that? So um, this is Doug. At Rocket Fuel, we invested a lot of money in detection, um, and you know this is something that um, ultimately I think the industry struggles with because um, our best solution is we can report um, on how much traffic is suspicious or fraudulent on any campaign that we run, um, and then it really comes down to um, do you trust the DSP's number who's buying the um, inventory, or do you want to trust a bonded third party? I think you know um, it's really about the industry getting together, working together, 
um, sharing best practices, and then really trying to make it really expensive for people to make fun, make money with fraud. So I think the more sophisticated players um, in the DSP space do a very, very good job of um, limiting fraud um, to very small percentages, whereas I think some of the less sophisticated players who are purely buying on segments probably do much um, worse of a job. Um, one example that we use all the time is if I wanted to create an ad fraud machine, I would definitely have it go to a number of in-market auto sites to get into third-party data supplies, so then I would get targeted and my site would get paid higher CPMs. But I think it really is about the industry coming together, good ad detection, and then very good transparency on every campaign you run. This is Leo. I could add to that. Uh, thanks, Doug. Um, you know, the industry is, and I, I work in quite a few industry initiatives, including those with the Media Rating Council. Um, so the Media Rating Council is currently about to um, issue final guidance on uh, mobile viewable impressions, both mobile web and in-app. Uh, there are certain requirements to um, for every uh, provider of advertising impression information that they should follow. Um, and the advertiser in the agency, DSP, everybody needs to be diligent. Are, are there vendors, are there partners um, doing business the proper way? Are they, when are they adhering to industry standards? Not just best practices, but above that standards and guidelines. Um, are they doing everything they can to um, filter the bad traffic out and the invalid traffic out? Are they ensuring viewability? Because pretty soon the only in, uh, currency in this business is going to be a a viewable impression by a human in, in, in a target audience bought and planned and bought. So um, I think it's very important that everybody be diligent about who they're doing business with, asking the right questions, asking questions, just not taking it at face value. Um, we're finding that a lot of the, the fraudsters are merely entering into the, the exchanges and doing business without even having a, a, an operational address. So, you know, if people ask questions and people, you know, look under the cover more as opposed to just letting the machines do the business, um, we'd, we'd be further along than we are right now. But I think we're going to have to move a pace to, uh, to ensure that all of our partners are doing business with good partners. And I think it's not a you – can't, you can't trust the daisy chain anymore. You really have to start asking questions. Great. Thank you both very much. Derek, anything to add, or uh, shall we move on to the next question? Uh, <clears throat> you know, we, we place a high premium on it. Um, candidly, you know, there are given months where, frankly, if we, you know, we, we've got such a high internal threshold against it that there are months that we will actually uh, eliminate more than 65 to 70 percent of potential impressions if we feel like that that's a material risk with regard to ad fraud. Viewability is also something that we're taking a really aggressive stance on, uh, and currently, uh, via third party, more than 99% of our ads are actually showing as uh, are actually being attributed as viewable. Um, it's something that we, as a publisher, feel a great responsibility and call upon all of our publishing partners to have the same sort of accountability in. Um, I tend to you know, generally agree with Doug and with Leo on this: is that you know this is this is a responsibility. Uh, that we believe, especially as a premium publisher, uh, we have to lead uh, the marketplace here with respect to both of those, both aspects of that conversation. Excellent, excellent responses, everyone. Thank you very much. Uh, on to the next question. Uh, this is presumably for Derek, but uh, Doug, you may be able to lend some insight into this as well. Um, are you specifically tracking retail sales to determine offline attribution, or is offline driven by other data insights? You know, uh, yeah, I'd be happy to touch base on this. Um, I, I think, as most probably on the call are familiar with, and perhaps even um, the questioner, uh, the the correlation to the actual point of purchase is incredibly complicated based on the category uh, and the retailer, uh, with various points and, and frankly various systems with regard to the actual uh, sale that a uh, retail partner may have and the fragmentation that takes place within the retail point of sale market. It gets incredibly difficult and frankly I don't think that we're probably going to be there with regard to a direct correlation to the actual credit card 
uh, beyond, you know, obviously a couple of players such as the Cartolytics of the world that frankly only have um, a, you know, a, a share of market that, you know, I, I, I wouldn't, I don't know the product, so I, I won't detail it, but let's just say it's probably less than 50% of the credit card market, and that discounts in many ways uh, cash transaction. What we believe is a more appropriate correlation is actually a physical measurement of, some, of a consumer being influenced into the location. Um, and so we can verify that. Uh, we can do that at, in, in really precise me measurement. Um, and ultimately what we work with a partner to understand is, is, is ultimately uh, beyond a conversation around what's the value of a transaction, what's the value of actually getting someone to that physical location? What is the likelihood that that consumer transacts? What's the lifetime value of, a, of, of that continued transaction beyond that initial visit? Uh, and so we really try to have very detailed conversations because, because we know that specific marketers may have different and unique perspectives with regard to that. We also believe that, that, that a critical component to that is one-to-one, -one, uh, and frankly getting beyond just limited sample sizes whether, the, whether that be within some of the various third-party at, I mean, mobile attribution tools or even some that were recently announced. Uh, at YP, we measure that on a one-to-one -one basis, uh, specifically to that unique m mobile ID. And we think that that's been a, a, a key driver and critical element of the success of the attribution that we're providing to our partners. Excellent. Uh, Doug, anything to add, or uh, shall we move on to the next one? Yeah, I was just going to say that I have to concur with Derek as much as you can, um, and with um, YP solution, it, it's great the one to one. Um, in the extreme cases, and it's a very narrow, um, some clients of ours actually onboard all of their purchase data of all of their customers into our DMP platform, and then we can actually attribute all of those things through their loyalty programs directly. It's a small minority because it means the advertiser has a lot of things clean in house. Um, and have that data available, and there's privacy and other things. But overall, the one-to-one -one tracking whenever possible through whatever mechanism is really, I think, what is key. And then where you can't do that, I think a lot of the solutions that Derek mentioned, while limited, are at least good things to at least look at to get directional influence. And then you can do some geo-testing and heavy ups and see if you're seeing that in your sell-through and sell-in numbers um, across your retail locations. Excellent. Thank you very much. Leo, anything to add? Well, just that um, I, I agree with Derek on the, uh, the point about it's hard to directly connect things to sales on a scale basis, but, um, you know, there are a number of, of, of uh, location companies, YP included, um, that are working with us and the media rating councils to help establish some guidelines and some base definitions around methodologies regarding how you count for traffic and how, um, what, what, what kind of measurements you should be using uh, for location-based advertising. Uh, this is an industry-wide effort that will produce, I think, really important um, benchmarks for us to look at so that, you know, YP and Rocket Fuel and, and all the other players in the marketplace can agree and abide by um, some standard definitions about, you know, what does it mean to generate foot traffic from an advertising campaign and uh, what methodologies you use, and then what do you do on top of that to create a unique selling proposition for yourself. So, you know, that by the end of this quarter, we'll probably have some uh, industry guidance on that. And that's going to help in the analytics, it's going to help in the attribution, and ultimately will help in calculating any sales lift you might get. But again, I don't think it's going to be as, as easy as one-to-one. -one. I think YP may be in, in a unique position to, to track that, but um, it's, it's, we're, going, we're going far fast uh, in, this, in this regard. Excellent. Thank you very much, Leo. I'm sure we will all keep an eye on our inboxes from that. I know I get MMA emails every day, and I'm sure a lot of people on here right now do as well. Okay, on to the next question. This one is for Doug. Doug, when you talk about moment scoring, how do you actually go about targeting those moments in your campaigns, similar to how a lot of people are already running something like weather targeting or uh, location-based targeting? How do you go about really taking those moments and putting them into the creative work and, and the buying process? Um, it's, it's a bit of a broad question, but maybe you can lend some insight. 
Sure. So, I mean, I think the first thing is you really think about your business and your consumers and get something that is optimizable that is going to um, mean value. And if you have something like, let's say, a credit card application that you're trying to drive towards, it's first about defining that success event. And then it's categorizing any first party or third party or other party data that you have that you feel like is going to be valuable to it. Um, but again, instead of sort of targeting those moments, it's about using all of that data to score the individual moments where you can then serve the right message. So you can use dynamic creative products. And, you know, I definitely see over coming quarters and years um, creative teams moving more from a TV mode of what is the best message I can put out there and broadcast to what are the 35 messages and image combinations that will address all of the significant micro profiles and then how do I load those into a decisioning engine so that as we're serving in a um, message to someone in a given context, how do they have enough variety to be able to impact that consumer in compelling ways? So it's a little bit of, as opposed to trying to find the right targeting, what are all of the targets that might be um, usable? What are all of the messages? What is all of the creative? And then how do you constantly optimize the delivery of that to gain more value out of each moment? Was that Excellent. Thank you. Enough? Sounded like it to me. Um, although, uh, if anyone else has any questions, please feel free to drop them in the, uh, the Q&A panel right now, and we will uh, get into them. Uh, but if not, we're going to begin winding down. We're just about running up to the end of this. Um, so we'll just give you guys a, a couple more, a few more moments to get in any, any last minute questions. Um, feel free to do so now. Leo, Derek, do you have anything to add on the, on the, the potential value of moment scoring and, and how that has, has, uh, has been really effective for, for your platforms? Derek specifically, I guess. You know, we think it's, uh, it's, it's been really critical. Um, you know, we, we actually, you know, believe that this has been a key driver. Um, I, I can't disclose the partner, but I, I, I know a, a very recent, uh, large big box retailer, uh, campaign that we, that we had from, uh, a, a display standpoint that we had done recently, uh, really showed, you know, frankly, tremendous results and, and, um, you know, taking the intent signal uh, and from YP and then understanding when within the context of all the moment scoring processes and algorithms that Rocket Fuel has enabled really led to um, uh, the KPI improvements above this particular retailer's uh, KPIs that was frankly, you know, more than 35 percent uh, of what their um, comparable campaigns were, were demonstrating. Uh, and we really, you know, saw that, and obviously that one just sort of sticks out to me most recently as, as just a huge illustration of understanding uh, that that beyond context, uh, the time and understanding how that behavioral data can actually influence understanding when's the right time uh, was a key differentiation in terms of the specific outcome that we drove for that partner. And I would just add, Leo here from the MMA, that uh, YP and, and Rocket Fuel are really talking about some really sophisticated um, uh, solution ideas here, which I think hold great, great prospects and great potential for the industry. And, you know, as we know, um, good ideas breed competition, and competition hopefully breeds innovation. Um, and I think, you know, you guys are right out in the front, and I'm glad I was a part of this today. So uh, thanks, Joe, and thanks, Doug, and thanks, Sarah, for um, sharing your insights. Thank you, Leo. Excellent. Thank you very much for that, Leo. Thank you, Derek, and thank you, Doug. Uh, this was much appreciated. Oh, you know what? We had one last great question come in that I think we should get to before we we, uh, we hang it up. What do you guys say? Ian? Sure. sure. All right. Great. Okay. Um, for all the panelists, a big topic, something we, we've been discussing a lot, especially within the past few months, is ad blocking. And 
specifically how DSPs and on the other end, publishers are responding to it. So do you guys see this uh, specifically local-based search, but you know, also elements like, like moment scoring and, uh, and really just uh, approaching advertising from a much more personalized and uh, much more customized perspective? Do you see that as having any impact on the ad blocking conundrum? Um, this is I'll take a look at that. Um, I, I think that ad blocking is rising. I don't think it's rising incredibly quickly from what we're seeing, um, and it's not necessarily consistent across devices in apps and those sorts of areas. Um, and so I think you know um, I think that as ads are more relevant, and you know to use the moment scoring paradigm. If you can get them the right message in the right moment where it's relevant to them, they're less likely to be annoyed by ads, and therefore they're less likely to be blocking ads. So I think it really, you know, if you think about the paradigm of 30 years ago where advertisers put on TV what they put on, and if it was relevant or not, it didn't really matter because you didn't have any choice. I think ad blocking is just sort of the most extreme example of consumers sort of voting with their maybe with their mouse clicks, not necessarily with their pocketbooks, about if they're getting irrelevant ads, if they're getting too many ads, if they're getting things that aren't meaningful to them and they don't get value from, then of course they're going to stop taking, stop um, subscribing to it, and then that leads to a bigger issue with the overall um, internet infrastructure being supported by ads. If ad blocking becomes a really um, large component, but I think more relevant better tailored ads in the right moment is in and of itself a big sort of antidote towards ad blocking. I think this is Leo, I think you're right, Doug, and I think um, the industry has enormous responsibility to um, try to improve the customer experience because customers customers are choosing to ad block ads because they're being chased by retargeting ads, they're being uh, pursued with the irrelevant ads, and frankly in some cases they're just getting over oversaturated with ads. So again, I think this is a diligence exercise that publishers, DSPs, SSPs, uh, all need to be, um, you know, when, when they enter into an exchange and they enter into business to try and grow their advertising revenue stream, uh, they've got to be careful about who they're doing business with. I mean, I, I use Ghostery just to see what's happening on some of my websites. And I went to a website today, and it's a, it's a, a top brand, highly acclaimed, you know, uh, newspaper website. There's 36 trackers on the one page I was looking at, you know, and if consumers see that, they're going to say, I want to block those because that's just, you know, I mean, somebody's trying to sell too much. Um, so I think we have to, you know, take a hard look at ourselves and say, you know, can, can we do this better? And I think it falls on everybody's uh, lap to kind of figure something out. But the consumer's telling you something's wrong. We've got to do something about it. Yeah, Leo, I think that's very well said. I think the one thing that I would add to that as well, though, um, I think advertisers have to think about what they're asking their vendors to do and their partners to do. Absolutely, for them. absolutely right, Derek. Absolutely right. Yeah. As a publisher, I can tell you, you know, it's certainly something that I would concur with Leo on, with regard to this. You know, as a premium publisher, we take this very seriously. Uh, we think it's the responsibility of the market to sort of lead this discussion rather than. Mm -hmm. Um, bury our head in the sand to some degree. Uh, as, 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 as primarily a, a utility for consumers, uh, we actually, uh, you know, feel very uh, comfortable with the things that are happening in the marketplace because our value exchange with consumers is very clean. Uh, the, the, the interesting component for, um, for us that we're, that we're frankly sort of watching in the marketplace so the last point that was made is, is with regard to what marketers uh, are asking or in some respects almost passively agreeing to by, by sending, uh, by continuing to uh, support and fund a lot of third-party data sourcing um, companies is, uh, you know, you have to sort of think about how that data is collected. Uh, and as a first-party data holder and publisher uh, with proprietary data, uh, you know, we have a very clean agreement uh, and, frankly, value exchange with our consumers that we think will ultimately be interesting to sort of watch shake out uh, over the next, let's just call it 16 months, to sort of understand if this has an adverse effect on third-party uh, 
data sourcing uh, and the value that, that that ultimately is attributed to, you know, from a marketing perspective, uh, you know, it, it, it's something that we certainly place a, a high value on as it relates to how we serve uh, and utilize that data and the impact that it may have for our marketers. But we're candidly, you know, participating at an MRC level and with the MMA specifically as it relates to mobile on this very topic because we take it very seriously. But uh, we'll also be watching pretty closely to understand uh, ultimately how the market kind of votes uh, with respect to uh, the value and or lack of value that they see as a result of this ad blocking um, uh, phenomenon that we're really seeing. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all very much for those insights. Those were superb. And uh, I think with that, uh, people are, are starting to hop out and, uh, you know, get to their 2 o'clock meetings. So uh, I think we'll call it there. Um, thank you all for an excellent webinar. And uh, everyone that's here, just as a quick reminder, tomorrow morning you will have a recorded version of this webinar. So feel free to share that with, uh, you know, your coworkers and, and friends and anyone that may get some value out of this. And uh, thank you very much for joining us today and have an excellent rest of your day. Okay. Thanks, Joe. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.